This is the word of the Lord. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them, most assuredly, that's verily, verily, it's amen, amen in Greek. Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have seen with your father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. And Jesus said, if Abraham, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father. And they said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. And Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. You are of your father, the devil, and the desire of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. And when he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? And if I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears God's word, words. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. God. That is the inspired word of God. And now some preaching on it. You know, in the Bible, all through Scripture, there are a number of central motifs or central themes, uh, central ideas that uh, God uses in Scripture to convey his salvation to us. Like dead to alive, like blind to seeing, like lost to found. But none, <laughs> none are more central or prominent than the one that is before us today. And that is from being enslaved to being set free. That, there is none more prominent than that motif. That, that theme, the, the salvation of God, the way he says I'm going to communicate it to my world and to my people, that, <coughs> excuse me, is the central motif. So, dear ones, our main goal today is to, is to get, is to get, is to see, okay? To see and to, and to grasp, see, and to experience the salvation that the salvation of Jesus has come, that he thinks he has come to win us, is seen as freedom from a life-killing enslavement into the new life of freedom with God. It, this, for us to grasp this, to see it, and to experience it in our lives. The, the gospel comes to us as a call to freedom, a call to be delivered from, rescued from bondage, to flee it, and to take hold and live in the freedom that comes with Jesus. Our little outline might go something like this. <clears throat> Number one, why we need freedom. 
Uh, number two, where does it come from? And number three, how to enter it and live in it. Okay? Why do we need it? Where does it come from? How do we enter it and live in it? Well, <coughs> excuse me. The, uh, the, there are two subheadings on why we need it that we'll touch on. And one is, well, we were made for freedom. I mean, the basic definition of freedom for anything is like to be what you were made for, you know, for, for, for anything, uh, whether it be even an inanimate uh, object or, is, or an animate one. That is, that is to be and act in a way that corresponds to the essence of its nature, okay? And, and that is, that is I, I was thinking of different illustrations and I had reason to recall from stories in the family and all about when, uh, when, when, when one of my many kids was, was young, we lived in St. Louis, so and I was taking a bunch of city kids to the St. Louis Zoo. And, and they hadn't seen animals, hardly anything. A lot of them were inner, inner city kids and all this. And so we're, St. Louis Zoo is pretty big and you're walking around these, these uh, mountain trails that lead up and they have all these boulders made, you know, and all that. So I'm, we're coming around this one corner and there was a great big bighorn sheep man laying right there on the, on the rock. And, and the kids were like, whoa! And I mean, they were astounded, you know, they're like 10 feet away from them or something like that. And one of those city boys looked and he says, wow, he says, look at that ram. And you know, so he'd been seeing the Dodge commercials and he says, look at, uh, look at that Dodge, he said. I mean, he said, look at that Dodge, <laughs> you know. And so he, th but then we came down off of there and we walked around the corner and then there was this great big cage and there was a great old eagle in this cage. And he was clutch clutching that roost he was on, and he looked depressed. He looked sad. And I remember, to this, I looked at that, and I hated that. And I said, that is so unnatural. That is so, that, uh, open that cage, let that thing out. It was enslaved. It, it, it was not free to be and act according to its essential nature. And listen, we were made, dear ones, to live with God. Jesus in this passage is pulling his hearers who are resisting him. He pulls them right back into Genesis, chapter 2 and chapter 3. Okay? You, have you noticed that? In verses 41 through 45 there, well, all through the thing in a way, he, he takes them back to the devil. He was a liar and a murderer from the beginning. He said, listen, we... we we are not only made to be free, we have given up that freedom. We, we have become enslaved. Even the lingo in the creation account. God created everything is good. He makes the man, he makes the woman. He says, nothing work, live, you know, work out here like this. He said, he said, and then he said, and you are free to eat of every tree of the garden. You're free to live and work and do, do all this and walk with me and commune with me and, and know who I am and know who you are. You're free. Do it all. He said, but, he says, there's one tree. Do not eat from that one. Well, why? Was it bad fruit? Were there... Spiders, uh, uh, no, no, there's only one reason why you not, do not eat from that tree. It's a glorious reason. It captures the whole essence of the relationship. He says, well, there's a singular, simple reason. Simply because I said so. That's the only reason. No, the fruit is good. Yeah, the fruit, the tree's good, everything is good. But just don't eat from it because I said so. And that preserves the relationship of who God is and who we are. We say, just because of who you are, that's good enough for me. That's the reason. Well, this is a profound thing. But then the devil comes in, and what does the devil do? He begins to question the veracity of what God says is good. What you can do and what you can't do. And so you know how the, how the story goes. It, and it's a sad story. So the man and the woman, they, they move into what is called 
writers call secular negative freedom. And he comes and he says, secular freedom, what does it mean to people? It means, yeah, you know, you, <laughs> you have the ability and the authority and the wisdom to, to know the difference between good and evil, to have the power. That's you. Maybe your group, maybe your political party, maybe who, whatever it is, but it's you people individually or collectively, you take to yourself the wisdom and the power to know the difference between what is good and what is not good, to know how to live life, how to carry on your relationships with people. And the man and the woman, they bought it. They bought the lie and they died. That was the day that the freedom of living and walking with God <laughs> turned into a life-killing enslavement. And the one that pulled them into that is a liar from the beginning and a murderer from the beginning. Listen, we need to, we need to get the heart of what Jesus is drawing these people back into, these people that do not believe in, in him. Uh, and, uh, and, and the people who didn't believe him, they, they didn't buy any of it. They didn't say, good night, what are you talking about? We're religious people, we believe in God. Because it opens up, remember in verse, then Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, but he said, you, you sort of believe in me. You know, have you ever thought about, about partial belief? Par partial, partial faith is really rebellion against God. Partial belief in him is, is being entrapped in sin because you, you believe in him, but you take him down just a little bit. And as soon as you have done that, you have rebelled against him and, and you're lost because now he's one of the authorities at the table of your life, but he is not, he is not the singular <laughs> trusting wise, infinitely wise and good one. And he said to the Jews, that is what you're doing. They, they, a, a person like Adam and what happened in, in Genesis 3 and what, and what these Jews were doing, they become the author of life. They become, they, they become the author of what's good and what's right. And the Bible has a word for that. As soon as you or I or us collectively or this group over here, or this, or this value in society, as soon as, as any of that becomes the author of life, the Bible has a word for what that is, and that word is slavery. Listen, we need to be set free because we were made for freedom, and we lost it and became enslaved to sin. Jesus said, Anyone who sins is a slave to sin. Anyone, anyone who deviates, you know, from me says a slave to sin. Woo. Well, uh, they did not accept him, you know. They, they were religious people, and, and they, were, they were, you know, scary to guys like me. They were Bible scholars, you know. They were religious leaders and all that, and they were missing Jesus. And we need to pay attention to this. Uh, you know, I wrote something down here that this is good, like a theological statement, but it's, it's, it's helpful. The whole premise of Scripture and Jesus in this, all through the Bible and here, is that the whole human order itself is in bondage to sin and needs to be set free. And it doesn't matter what flag you're, you live under. It, it's, it's a bondage to sin and death is what gives rise, you know, to all of the pervasive wrongdoings in this world. Individually, in America, and so, so people in America say, hey, don't go preaching a, that kind of a sermon to us on the 4th of July, man, we're free. And Jesus said, look, even if you live under the American flag, you, you still may be enslaved. You still may not be free. So it's a, it's a, it's a word of deliverance. It's a word of, of caution. And there, there is a tyranny and a bondage of sin. So, uh, it's a serious warning in this passage to not miss that point that, that we, need, we need to be set free uh, by the Son of God. 
three times in, uh, in this passage, in chapter eight, throughout chapter, three times Jesus, Jesus will say, if you don't listen to my words and believe in me, if you don't believe I am who I say I am, if three times he says, you will die in your sin. You will die in it. Even if you're a religious person, but if you take him down as just one of your authorities, you will die in that sin. You will die in it. And it will, it will be a, a, a sore bondage. Uh, years ago, Tom Skinner at an Urbana conference, he gave a one, it was right at the 4th of July, he gave a, a, a wonderful statement and I, and I, I, I kept it in a file and, uh, and I looked at it more than once. He said, listen, he was talking about revolution, you know. He said, a revolution takes an existing situation that has proven to be unworkable, unjust, unworthy of the greatness of what it means to be a person. And you seek to overthrow it, to liberate people from it, and replace it with something that is just and right and good, and that actually works. Now this has been the rhetoric of every humanly initiated revolution in the history of man. And look how it has and is working out. They have all come and gone in abject failure. Whoa. The whole premise of scripture is that the human order is archaic, unworkable, unjust, infected with and controlled by demonic powers, manifesting themselves in things like racism, greed, hatred, anger, unbridled lusts, endless wars, corruption in low and high places, in short, ungodliness. And no one has been able to overthrow the existing order, either in society or in the depths of an individual person, and establish a new and lasting order of righteousness and reconciliation and goodness with God and your fellow man and woman until the promised deliverer came into the world to overthrow the existing order of things and bring the redemption, righteousness, and goodness of God's kingdom to bear on your life. In other words, to bring the glorious freedom of the Son of God. Some of that was my paraphrase. But dear ones, I think that's a marvelous and true statement. That So when we put our hope of freedom simply in a political system or in the amount of security that I can accumulate for myself and in the way of life that seems to work out for me, even though it doesn't completely adhere to God's word, as so even in those contexts, we, uh, we have not yet found the liberator. So that's where it comes from. It comes from Jesus and Jesus alone. So I would ask you a question. So you are enslaved and you will die in that slavery unless the Son of God, Jesus, sets you free. How would you preach that in prison? Well, I've had to do it. And, uh, and how do you say to the prisoners, and, and I've done it in maximum security things where these guys are not getting out for a long, long, long time. And I say, look, if you believe in Jesus, the Son of God, you will be set free from your fundamental bondage and uh, entrapment. <laughs> really? <laughs> They're not even going to hear my case again, man. <laughs> you know, it, so all this can be going on in your mind. Now, how would you preach it, let's say, to the billionaires in tech land, in Silicon Valley, or to upper middle class people in Grand Rapids who are very secure in their lives and they can do about what they want to. They're plugging along really good. And, uh, and you say, look, you, you need to be set free. And you say, what do you mean? we are free. And Jesus would say, no, no, you're not. So how would you preach? You say, well, look, here's what you need. Jesus said, look, 
If you abide in my word, uh, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall shut you free. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. So it comes through knowing Jesus and his word. And, and uh, the Apostle Paul follows Jesus, a theme, you know, here in John 8. When you look up these words, and, and they're not all just simply stated as freedom, other kind of uh, uh, words that are synonyms and all, but you will find this theme is, flows all the way through Scripture, Old and New Testament. But do you remember what he says in Galatians 5? He, he makes a stunning statement as he opens Galatians 5. He's been talking about the gospel, and this is the first letter uh, th that was written to the churches. He said, this is what he says in verse, verse uh, 1 of chapter 5. He says, look, what I've been trying to say is it is for freedom that Christ has set you free. That, that is a stunning statement. It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. And, and what does he mean? What does he mean by that? Some of the scholars of that uh, book have said things like this. Everything we take home from the book of Galatians hinges on our ability to get what the term freedom means in this letter. And what did he say? Listen, here's what he said. One place in chapter 3, verse 22. But the scriptures declare that the whole world is a prisoner of sin, so that what was promised, being given through faith in Jesus Christ, might be given to those who believe. What is promised in Jesus Christ? Paul goes on in chapter 8 of Romans. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ, Jesus from the law of sin and death. For what God has, got, for God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk according to the flesh, not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Listen, dear ones, our, our call to freedom didn't begin with our conception of freedom or our, our uh, ability to, to know. It began with Jesus coming to claim you and to announce to you that this, this alienation from God, this built-in resistance to accept him wholly as God and to obey him, Jesus has taken all of that default upon himself, yours, and he has borne it away. He's taken it off the table, as it were. That, that, that the, the estrangement has been dealt with. And you by faith can believe in that. And you can embrace God. And you can be his child. A son abides in the house forever, he says in John 8. He says, and, and that is the freedom that comes in Jesus Christ. And not only that, he says, he says, your freedom, he says, is that you now walk in his ways and you follow his words. It's just, you know, in, in Romans 6, he uses that. He speaks in, in human terms. And he says, you know, once you yielded the, the members of your body as instruments unto unrighteousness, you yielded your body, you gave yourself. He said, now you've been set free. And not only has the condemnation been taken away, you have a new heart. And now you follow hard after God. And you, you, you use the members of your body and your mind and your spirit as an instrument of righteousness to know God's word and to follow him. Uh, one writer says this, The day I relinquished my autonomy, that is being a law unto myself, and became wholly dependent on Jesus alone, is the day that I found my freedom. The day, it was the day of my emancipation. The day I relinquished my independence from God and declared my utter dependence on Jesus alone is the day Jesus set me free and I found my freedom. Listen, I remember John Penn, he had a brother named William, 
John and William Penn from Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, and they were in a maximum security prison for a long time. We were studying these things, and John Penn became a Christian. And John Penn, I remember, he stood up, and he says, well, John Penn, huh? what do you mean you're a Christian? He said, I'm a new man in Christ. Now, some of his language and syntax was was of a, of a certain street kind and all that, but, but he, this is a fairly close quote. And he says, no, he says, I'm a new man. He says, I'm not the man that I used to be. He says, and I'll tell you what, he says, Jesus has taken my sins away from me on his cross. And, and, and pastors showed us in the word of God, he says that, that because he's risen from the dead, I have a new life. And he says, and I wanna tell you something. And, and I don't think anybody <laughs> would say, well, I don't believe it. He'd have punched him in the nose probably, but he, but he said, he said, I would rather be in here for the rest of my life with Jesus Christ as my savior than I would to be back out where I was with all the money and the freedom I had. He said, that was not freedom. And I'll tell you something else. He said, my conscience is finally working. And I said, wow. I said, that... That is what Jesus is getting at here. This, this is what our freedom begins with our declaration, not of independence, but our freedom begins with our declaration of dependence on the Son of God who died for me and who gave me his truth as the, as the light on the path of my life and strength to my bones to know him and to know his truth. Jesus says, that's how you enter freedom. And that's how you live in it. So any and every situation that, that you face in life, dear ones, the question will be, do you know and do you grasp? And, and do you then engage into the experience of your life that Jesus is the saving authority alone? And that his word is the thing that puts an infallible light on whatever you face, no matter what other authorities say would happen. So, what situations have I faced this week even? Well, uh, yesterday I was talking with a young woman, a young man, who uh, they fell in love. And uh, definition of terms now. Who tells me what love is? And they're living together unmarried, and they're doing many other things that are working out just fine for them, and they're very happy. So don't, don't anyone tell them they're not free. Isn't that the case? And you sit back with a certain sadness and say, no, it's not. No, you're, you're, actually, you're actually in bondage and it's not gonna go well nor end well for you. And then here's a person, another one. There was a situation between two people, and jealousy was ruling their lives, not only of one another, but of the values of the culture out here. And one thing led to another, to alienation in the relationship. And, and jealousy works out in a lot of, the, but jealousy was there. And, and where did that come from? Well, it came from a bunch of lies. You know, what is it that, that you don't have in God that will somehow keep you from being and living according to your glorious, essential nature? And the answer is actually nothing. No, no, not good looks, not a boyfriend, not a girlfriend. If I, don't have, if I don't have good looks, if I don't have a boyfriend, if I don't have a girlfriend, if I got... If I have ill, none of that can keep me from being the glorious person that God has made me to be if I know Jesus and follow his word. I, I'm, I'm striving, as you can see, to, 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 get a, to get across to us the glorious freedom in life to know Jesus and to follow his word and his teaching. And he kept telling the Jews, he says, you have no room. You have no room in you for my word. Because my word 
comes with authority from the Father. But my word is, is supreme. It's glorious. It's the truth about reality. And you have no room for that. Oh, you take my word, but it, you give it a different place. So you have no room for my word. This is, a, this is important for people like us. Because we think we take his word. Because, man, we know it. We can quote it. That's our tradition. But he says, and the, but see, these Jews, they knew it too. They could quote you Deuteronomy and Exodus and all that. But they didn't receive it the way he gave it. So that wonderful paradox of freedom, dear ones, is to relinquish your independency and declare your dependency on, on God. There's a seriousness in this passage, okay? A seriousness for those who don't get it. And Jesus said, you're of your father, the devil, and the works of your father you're going to do. They thought they were wonderful in their society. And he says, no, he says, you're, you're, just, you're just killing people and you're telling them lies. And they thought they were upstanding people. So that the serious warning, you will, you will die in those sins and you will hurt many people along the way. That's a serious warning, okay? But there's also a serious liberation, a serious celebration. Do you see what's offered to you? Do I see it? Do I see it? Do I grasp it? And do I pull it into the experience of my life on every level? This is the glorious freedom. There's a wonderful passage in Psalm 119. You might write it down. Uh, Psalm 119, you know, the great poem on the word of God. It follows the Hebrew alphabet. Every letter in the Hebrew alphabet is one of the stanzas. And, uh, and the, the glories of God's word. And two of the verses that I especially love are, Verse 32 and 45, and it says this, it says, the psalmist is rejoicing in the goodness of God's word. He says, I, I'm, I got a song. He says, here's my song. I run in the path of your commands, for you have set my heart free. That's quite a statement. I walk about in freedom, for I have sought out your precepts. This is the freedom that is offered to us in the Son of God, Jesus, our Savior. Our freedom yet lies ahead, some of it, okay? And we close with this, Romans 8, 19 and 21. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. <laughs> for your glorious self to be finally revealed for who you really are and have been as a child of God. It, it waits in expectation, and so do you and I wait for that. For the creation was subje subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. In other words, he's making this world sin sick, of living in the enslavement that they live in. He's subjecting all of that to frustration out of his work of grace in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. Dear friends, your freedom not going to come from anything you have or can create or anybody else can. It's not going to come on, on November the 5th. It's not going to come from anything like that. Your freedom is found in Jesus and the Son of God and in his words. May we see it anew. May we grasp it anew. And may we pull it into the experience of our actual lives day by day. Let's sing a wonderful hymn, When Peace Like a River, number 445. I remember where I was the first time I ever sang 
this hymn. I was a fairly new Christian out of the military. I was 20, almost 22 years old. And this song choked me. <laughs> and let we, let's stand and sing it with faith, giving glory to God. My sin not in part but the whole was nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul.